welcome to Ask the Educator, a podcast brought to you by Healthmark Industries. Are you a sterile processing technician or manager? Maybe you work in infection prevention or biomedical engineering. Whether you're a frontline tech, endoscopy tech, OR nurse, or surgical services administrator, you undoubtedly have influence in medical device processing at your facility. In each episode, we speak with experts from the Healthmark Clinical Affairs team, industry leaders, or special guests from the trenches to answer your questions and bring you relevant industry information, equipping you for excellence in medical device processing. My name is Kevin Anderson, and I will be your host. Now let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. This is Kevin Anderson here, your host. And with me today on this episode, I have Seth Hendy, another uh clinical education specialist here at Healthmark. And Seth, it's always great to have you and just welcome back to the show, man. Thanks for having me, Kevin. I love doing these. In this episode, we wanted to kind of bring up a close related topic to the last episode that we did. If you guys didn't catch it, it's another one of the survey readiness series episodes that I did with Stephen Kovac around point of use care and doing case card audits to uh, ensure quality at point of use care. Well, in this week's episode, we are talking about transportation of those medical devices because this is something that is a really big topic when it comes to survey preparedness. And because there are so many different departments and locations now sending us these devices. Seth, I'm sure you can relay, but uh, I'd imagine back in your facility, there were all kinds of different things going on with transportation of instruments, very unstandardized, very kind of do what you want type of scenario, right? Oh, exactly. You know, everybody wants to do what's most convenient for them. And while I sympathize, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. You know, we decided on a homectic that should be universal, except one of our clinics was an eye clinic who said, we're worried about TAS. And so we won't spray any extra enzymes. And so there's an example of something actually legitimate. That's a department with with a legitimate concern trying to say, hey, your universal thought didn't work for us. And so we said, okay, first hurdle of many to figure out what to do. That's right. I mean, there's always going to be something, but we like to standardize and that standardization is good, but you also have to have some leeway for those circumstances, just like you said. One thing that we want to point out is that these standards and guidelines and regulations uh, that are surrounding this type of practice. Back in, in my facility, we used to have people send things in just the most random ways. We would have stylets come down through our tube system where normally you're thinking, you know, maybe you might send somebody a note or whatever. No, we had a style, a reusable stylet stuffed inside of a biohazard bag, didn't even fit in this thing. And it had a little note tape to it that it was from the ICU, you know, and they wanted it reprocessed. Like you're sending this dirty stylet down through, I, it just blew my mind, right? And, and this is the kind of reason why it's really important to iron out your transportation of medical devices in your facility, right? (laughs) And make sure everybody truly understands what's required because it's easy pickings that, you know, you you talk about that. I've I've seen um, scissors tied up in an exam glove and carried down, you know, through the hall. And I'm telling you, they're the, the things that make this Uh, work regulatorily are very easy to see. So when you're not doing them, they are a bullseye for somebody to, to start shooting at. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that transportation component, like you said, it stands out like a sore thumb, especially when somebody just wraps up a dirty instrument in a, in a, in a glove that they had on. I mean, it just, that is the kind of stuff that will, that, that will bring your surveyors in and, and, Uh, cause them to really dig deep into the process. But one thing I wanted to do was really quickly uh, share some of the high level regulatory points. So this is, you know, what the federal government is saying that we need to do. So Seth, can you share a little bit about just the OSHA regulations around this transportation of instruments? Absolutely. And you're right. This goes beyond Amy. It goes beyond AORN. Those are recommended practices. OSHA is a regulatory body. So we're talking about laws, right, at this point. Now, the laws are pretty simple. 
solid sided lid leak proof on the sides and bottom uh, marked as biohazardous right you know seems to be four things that are pretty easy to say but lately i've been throwing in it comes with an ifu now that may not come from osha but i gotta tell you if you're not thinking about a container that has instructions for disinfection a surveyor's coming in saying hmm that container looks like you may have purchased it from Walmart. And who told you it could go through your cart washer? How do you know that that provides disinfection when there's nothing in writing about it? So while the IFU is not the regulatory part, you've certainly got to be thinking about it. Absolutely. I love that you brought that up because I feel like that was a real world scenario. I remember when this first came up in, in our health system. There were people saying, hey, I'll, don't worry about it. All you got to do is pick up a simple uh, tote from one of your local stores and use that. And, you know, people did actually do that stuff. But when you get it into your department and you try and figure out how to reprocess this thing, because let's be real, I mean, it's going back with a clean or sterilized instrument inside of it. It, too, needs to be cleaned and disinfected and all of that. So, most of those totes that I've seen in those stores, one, they don't come with that reprocessing IFU, like you mentioned, and two, they get damaged. They can't hold up to the rigors of, of a sterile processing department in the hospital. So that was my experience with it, you know, but I thought that was a really, really good point. Absolutely. Yep. Where's your materials compatibility? You know, beyond the IFU, we're going to subject it to a disinfection process and it's compatible to accept those materials, you know, whatever that disinfected is and release it. Right. So that we're not, you know, holding on to things and, and they just don't have it because that's not what they were made. For. Exactly. So one thing that I think is really important, too, is that we also can consider the IFUs and our standards and guidelines when it comes to the transport of these devices as well. And obviously from different clinics and different locations of the hospital, that might look different based on the device you're transporting. Uh, but one thing that like comes to my mind uh, from my facility is like TEE probes was another one uh, where they have very special containers and things like that. And that for good reason to protect them and, and all of that. But is there anything like that that you remember in your facility where it's like, we really had to look at the IFUs, we really had to look at the standards on this one because it was just a unique situation, unique device that we really needed to make sure it was being transported correctly? Absolutely. And, and I love that, that example uh, because a lot of times uh, many departments are getting centralized and flexible endoscopes are becoming part of an SPD's job responsibility. And they have such specific parameters. If you are coiling them smaller than a certain diameter, depending on how big the scope is, you're causing damage. You're causing internal damage. You may not be able to see it, but it's, it's happening. And that's why those instructions are there. But, you know, anything over over large um, or heavy becomes a challenge for the person transporting it and the, the device it's being transported in. Because, you know, it's not only about the, the safety of the worker, but it's about the environment, too. So so just know, you know, this is OSHA talks about keeping your worker safe by having it be puncture resistant and leak proof and that kind of stuff. But that also is so we don't spill in the hall. We don't actually contain the environment being transported to. And so the more heavy, awkward, or complex that device is, the, the harder they are. That's why I thought of the TEE probe, just because it was like something that, uh, if you've ever seen the containers, they, they look totally different and there's something very unique. So it just popped into my mind as an example. But I think another thing to speak to maybe, and this is not necessarily a regulatory or a standard or guideline or anything, but you might think of it more as a best practice of just having some sort of standardized handoff process, right? Because it was pointed out to me on numerous occasions that, hey, we brought such and such thing here and you guys lost it. So you might want to consider some sort of standardized handoff process. Did you have something like that, a similar experience where you were? Yep. Now, thankfully, 
that doesn't get so prescriptive. Like you said, this isn't a regulation. There are just great tags and stuff out there. Very simple things and some that can even hold up to washing processes. So if you get this tagged right, especially at point of use and it comes down, you know, emblazoned with ICU written on it and that can stay through the entire washing process. And then we see it on the other side and we go, oh, well, this is going back to the ICU. You know, so thankfully to that end, there are some quite simple ways where you just get a tag, you get people writing on it, you make sure that the practice is consistent and you stop losing stuff because you're hundred percent right. It's, it's a big deal. Exactly. We used to use containers similar to a tackle box at one point, and we just put those luggage tags on them. We used a, a biohazardous luggage tag. And then, you know, when it was clean, we just put the the regular white tag on it. And that was a nice solution. However, our system decided to standardize across the system to use, actually they, you know, this is before I worked with Healthmark, but they standardized to the SST tray that has the biohazard label right on it. One of the, one of the reasons I didn't go to that in the beginning was just because it always had the biohazard symbol on it. But now we have those nice clean stickers. They peel right off. You know, you can put them on when it's clean, peels off, and there's no <laughs> residue, which is nice. So even those very simple labeling things, there's so many options at our disposal anymore. Oh, yeah. Well, the reason we, we used hang tags and it's be, was because of the color array. So as a matter of fact, we had seven uh, seven different colors of hang tags uh, already in the department because those were for the OR. And that marked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That was part of our organizing system for OR sets. So we said, well, there's still many more colors of the rainbow. So why don't we get specific colors? This one's for, for the ER. And, and so there was a a pretty simple color coding system. And I mean, why not use tools like that? They're simple to use uh, and, and they work really well. So did you guys ever figure out a great way to document your handoff or document your transportation process with all these different uh, departments and all of that? I know that was a, a challenge for us. And so we really needed to work on that. But we also had you know, a paper process. We also had, you know, our SPM and all of that sort of thing. So how did you guys handle that? We relied very heavily on SPM. Um, but there are those things that you, you couldn't put a barcode on. Uh, and those, it was still, it was still a paper process. You know, thankfully those records aren't something that you've got to hold on to for, for seven years, like a sterilization record. But, you know, that, that was something until, until something went out that record had to be maintained. That's what we were saying. We said, okay, it, we've got a time in and a person in until we see a time out and a person out, we're holding on to this. You know, even if it's one out of 12 that was on the sheet, you need that record until you're sure it goes out and then you can kind of, you know, reset and, and keep going. So as long as there's weird, small instruments, you're probably going to have to write them down. You're going to have to have something fairly low tech that just says, I brought it. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's kind of what we did, especially with those dang stylets, man. That was the one contentious device, no matter what department, because they had them all over the place, whether it was ER, ICU, operating room, we had to label them. You know, we gave them their own color coded tape, instrument tape or whatever for each department. And they'd always come back, you know, saying they're gone or they don't have enough. And (laughs) <laughs> Where are you sending my stylus and all that? So uh, one of our simple documentation things came up born from those uh, stylets that I really love referring to. <laughs> well, very similar in procedure, laryngeal blades. Yes. Where, yeah. do, you, where do you stick a, a, a SPM label on a laryngeal blade? You don't. Exactly. So you, you, you're writing that stuff down. Yep. Yeah, I think that pretty much covers all of the things related to transportation. The funny thing is is it's very simple you have very simple osha guidelines and requirements there you have very simple things spelled out for you in ifus and and standards and things like that funny thing about this topic is as simple as it is to implement it's very challenging right be only because there's so many different moving departments and pieces going at the same time with this and and getting all on the same page uh one thing i'd love to see and i i don't know maybe seth i'm gonna put you on the spot but i have not heard of anyone ever doing this 
building a transportation, a point of use care and transportation module in their health stream that's right built into everybody's education, their yearly competence. Remember, we would get those for fire training and all of that stuff, mandatory. Why mm-hmm. haven't they done that with us? It would be so simple, right? Did they do that at your facility? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, you know, so we had uh, uh, mandatories around red bag training and things like that, because that absolutely is OSHA and it's and that one's understood and has been for a little while. Those are so close. Those practices are so close and their regulations are so close. I don't understand how that's not enveloped into one thing and it never was. Right? I know. I keep waiting for somebody to t- tell me they, they've done that, but it's just it. It hasn't happened yet. I think it's a great opportunity for somebody out there to to bring a great idea to their uh, education team in their uh, healthcare facility. But Seth, thanks for covering this one with me. I'm I'm hoping that we're helping everybody get a little bit closer to survey readiness as uh, a lot of facilities we know are in their window right now. And uh, we've been out doing a lot of audits lately, and I'm still seeing it as, as just as you said, as much as this is pretty straightforward, I'm seeing non-compliance in many of the places that we go. So think about your facility uh, very closely because you, you might be non-compliant and you need to be. Excellent, Seth. Thanks so much, man. Thanks, Kevin. That wraps up another Survey Readiness Series podcast. And in this one, Seth Hendy and I discussed the transportation of reusable medical devices. No, you cannot wrap up a dirty instrument in a glove or send it through the tube system. You're going to need to use containers that are OSHA compliant, which means they're going to be leak-proof on the sides and bottom. They're going to have a lid and they're puncture resistant and it has a biohazard label on it. Another important consideration is does your transport container have an IFU for cleaning and disinfection instructions? Containers are going to have to stand up to the rigors of reuse in a hospital setting. Remember to consider device IFUs when selecting your transport containers. Remember to think about things like flexible endoscopes that have specific recommendations for how tightly they can be coiled. And lastly, consider having a standardized handoff process so that devices can be tracked and documented throughout the chain of custody. I hope these tips will help you get survey ready regarding transportation of your reusable medical devices. If you need help finding transport containers that are OSHA compliant, please let us know. We'd be happy to help. You can send any questions to us at asktheeducator at hmark.com. Thanks again for listening, and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. All opinions expressed on this show are those of the presenters. Before using any medical device, it is important to review the device manufacturer's instructions for use.